Well, all of you who signed up today really are interested in covering this very important step one topic, which is the general pathology section. Now, I know for many of you who've had friends or colleagues who have just taken the exam, everybody walks out being like, you got to know the first three chapters of pathoma. And today, I'm not just going to read you the first three chapters of pathoma. I am actually going to help you apply the first three chapters of pathoma. My passion is for you to take all of this content that you are getting from Boards and Beyond, from First Aid, from Pathoma, from all of these resources, and narrow them down, focusing on application and integration of content. Now, for many of you, this is the first time you are seeing me and meeting me. I first off just want to say welcome. My name is Rahul. I am currently a pediatric critical care fellow. I just started my second year of fellowship, PGY5. Can you believe it? Um, more than anything, though, I have been absolutely passionate about helping students prepare for the USMLE. It has been an absolute passion of mine and a wonderful project to start this high guru from the ground up, connecting with each of you one single communication at a time. If you ever have any questions, let me just do this. I am more than willing to email you, to text you, to call you. I am here to help you. And I hope throughout this webinar, you will find value in this methodology of preparation. What makes us unique? Well, I just told you. I like to focus on active recall. I like to take fundamental topics and integrate them across organ systems. And I like to map all of this material, all of this application to the USMLE content outline. Today, we are going to be going through chapters one through three of Pathoma. Please make sure you have the handout. And if I'm going too fast or if you miss something, just go ahead and put it in the chat. I will, even on the break, be answering questions and coming back to concepts that are challenging. Let's go ahead and get started. The first thing that we will do today is go through basic principles. Let's go through our first question. The first question I want to ask you all is what is the difference between hyperplasia and hypertrophy? So these are basic vocab. Think to yourself. And we know that hypertrophy is going to be an increase in cell size. The mechanism that the USMLA likes to test you on is that it involves gene activation, protein synthesis, and production of new organelles. Now, let me pause right here and tell you that anytime you see on this webinar a yellow highlighted term, that is a term that integrates pathophysiology as well as can be found on the NBME exams. It is very important for you to focus on the whole webinar, but in particular, these yellow points. In the chat, I don't think I got the handout. Where can I get it? It is all the way at the top of the chat, but if you haven't gotten it, here it is one more time. Let me go ahead and post it to everyone if you haven't gotten the handout, no problem. All right, so when we talk about hyperplasia, remember that that's an increase in cell number. And the mechanism here is that you have new cells that come from stem cells. And guys, you need to know that stem cells are what we call pluripotent cells. One of the reasons why I'm so passionate about going into these basic principles is because there's a common misnomer that's out there. People say BPH equals benign prostatic hypertrophy. And the last time I checked, you don't go to the gym to actually work out your prostate. Ah, that's right. It is benign prostatic hyperplasia. Watch for in your USMLA question. Old man has dribbling, is going to have incomplete voiding, and the pathophysiologic mechanism here is going to be that the man has actual hyperplasia of the prostate cells near the periurethral zone. All right, let's go through this vignette. A woman 39 weeks pregnant presents for routine ultrasound. The OB notes 
an enlarged uterus relative to the first trimester? What is the likely mechanism? This is third trimester lady. And the mechanism here is that the uterus has undergone both hyperplasia as well as hypertrophy. Hyperplasia because of the estrogen and progesterone, which is elevated during pregnancy. Our next vignette, a 50 year old male with atherosclerosis and myocardial infarction presents for an echocardiogram. This is a risk factor and this is a risk factor to pay attention to in the question. The physician notes that his EF, which is ejection fraction, has diminished and his left ventricular measurements have increased from 47 to 55. They have gotten larger. What is the mechanism here? Well, if you follow along with me, you know that this patient is going to have hypertrophy of the cardiac muscle. Remember that when you're talking about hypertrophy of the cardiac muscle, this is going to correlate to a very important cardiac physiology question. And that is that when patients have hypertrophy of cardiac muscle, you will hear an S4. What is an S4? An S4 is going to be a late diastolic sound that represents the atria contracting into a stiff, non-compliant ventricle. Remember that in hypertrophy, you are going to have the myocytes arranged in parallel. Cardiac muscle is going to be a permanent tissue. And remember that permanent tissues, unlike the uterus, permanent tissues, which are cardiac muscle, skeletal muscle, and nerve, they do not undergo hyperplasia, but rather they undergo hypertrophy, an increase in cell size. An athlete presents to the orthopedic doctor after being on crutches for a broken right femur. She has a fracture. The orthopedic doctor notes that there is decreased calf circumference on the right where she broke it relative to the left. What is the mechanism underlying this change? Well, in this scenario, the patient because the patient has been immobilized, has undergone atrophy. Now, atrophy is going to be kind of the opposite of hypertrophy and hyperplasia. It's a decrease in cell number and size. The mechanism here is that, remember that there is apoptosis that goes on on the cellular level. And the two mechanisms for a decrease in cell size are going to be related to this biochemistry tie-in, and that is the ubiquitin proteasome degradation cytoskeleton. Think about the proteasome as being a lawnmower chopper, that any protein that goes through it, the lawnmower is going to activate its motor and break that protein down. Well, in order to be tagged to that lawnmower, you need to have ubiquitin right on there. And so ubiquitin tags cells for degradation. Think of it like a post-it note getting on a cell. Now, the other mechanism is going to be something known as autophagy. Autophagy is going to be essentially eating of yourself via vacuoles and lysosomes. Next question. An obese patient with the eight-week history of dry cough that is worse at night. When you see dry cough worse at night, Remember that at night, the patient is laying flat. So this is going to be a cough that is most likely related to GERD. We'll keep reading. Occasional chest tightness after meals. When you see chest tightness, you may be thinking, oh, this could be angina related. However, when it is related to meals, that is more GERD related. Now, other things for you to understand is that dry cough, hoarseness, metallic taste, these are all going to be in USMLA questions related to the fact that patients with GERD are going to have recurrent laryngeal nerve damage. Anatomy tie-in, recurrent laryngeal nerve is going to be related to the vagus nerve, and it is going to be related to, you got it, it's going to be related to arch number six for an embryology tie-in. Now, when you're talking about GERD, 
The pathological term here is going to be known as metaplasia. Think about metaplasia as normal cells getting replaced by normal cells, i.e. at the lower esophagus, you have the non-keratinized squamous epithelium getting actually overtaken by the columnar non-ciliated mucinous epithelium. And so the mechanism here is going to involve reprogramming of stem cells. And this is how you are going to essentially handle stress. Remember that when you're talking about acid that is going to be at the esophageal region, in order to combat the stress, the acid, the tissue has to change. Now, when we talk about metaplasia, think about it to yourself. Is metaplasia reversible? And the answer is yes, it is reversible only if you actually take away the stress. And so that's why chronic GERD can actually lead to which high yield pathology? Well, it's going to be Barrett's esophagus. And Barrett's esophagus is going to be a precursor to esophageal adenocarcinoma. This is going to follow the metaplasia dysplasia carcinoma sequence, something that's also very high yield and we are going to integrate back in, neopla in neoplasia. Now, the exception to this rule is going to be apocrine metaplasia. Apocrine metaplasia of the breast actually is not going to be related to a cancer. So remember that when you're talking about apocrine metaplasia, we are going to have actual cell pinching off of the membrane. That is apocrine secretion, which is important for you to know from a histology standpoint. And so related to this, metaplasia can be related to some nutritional deficiencies. The most common nutritional deficiency is going to be related to vitamin A. Now, vitamin A, let's go ahead and integrate some questions. But before we go into integrating some questions, we need to understand that vitamin A is needed for maintenance of specialized epithelium as well as cell turnover. So immature cells go to mature cells because of vitamin A. That's important in your questions related to acne. That's why we use vitamin A derivatives, retin-A, for example, to treat acne because it overturns our cells that could be actually blocked and infected by the anaerobic bacteria, propionis bacterium. The other question that they ask on the USMLA is going to be related to M3 AML. Now, M3 AML, acute promyelocytic leukemia, is going to be related to a retinoic acid mutation. And that's why we use vitamin A to take the blast cells and essentially mature them into normal myocytes. And so when we're thinking about vitamin A deficiency, just think about your cells not necessarily turning over. One of them is going to be what we call keratomalacia. This is where the conjunctiva of the eye is going to essentially start thickening, 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 thickening. And that's why vitamin A deficiency, you are going to get, you got it, you are going to get night blindness. And so this is going to be a slide for you to keep in mind in which you have Barrett's esophagus, which is going to be pictured right here. And this is where, again, you have this intestinal metaplasia of the actual lower esophageal region. Now, when you're talking about your apocrine secretion, that is, you got it, the pinching off of the apical portion. Continuing on, a 33-year-old female presents to her OBGYN for health maintenance. She undergoes pap smear showing atypical cells in which she undergoes a cervical biopsy. And look, the cervical biopsy shows CIN1. What does that mean? CIN1 is cervical intraepithelial neoplasia. So this whole sentence is talking about cancer, cancer, cancer. So what is cancer really related to? Well, we're gonna get to it, but this is part of our fundamentals. And this is going to be called dysplasia. Now, dysplasia is essentially defined as disordered cell growth. And the precursors to dysplasia could be longstanding pathological hyperplasia. Remember that there is the hyperplasia dysplasia carcinoma sequence. 
And when you're thinking about longstanding hyperplasia, this is the test question in which they have a patient who is on some sort of estrogen derivatives. They have endometrial hyperplasia. That endometrial hyperplasia over time undergoes dysplasia and then subsequently carcinoma. The other element is going to be metaplasia. And we just talked about this when we were discussing Barrett's esophagus. When we think about the difference between carcinoma and dysplasia, remember that dysplasia is reversible. So metaplasia, dysplasia is reversible. Remove the stress. That's why your next question with the Barrett's esophagus could be, what should we do? And that's, for example, proton pump inhibitors, dietary changes, ex weight loss, et cetera, right? Because that's going to help improve the GERD. Now, carcinoma is irreversible. All right. Well, continuing on in this case, the patient is deemed to have poorly differentiated cervical carcinoma. Now, what is the pathological term referring to the loss of differentiation from the normal tissue? So what this means is the loss of differentiation. Essentially, that is saying, what is it called when you go from normal tissue to a little bit abnormal tissue? and that's going to be known as anaplasia. Now, anaplasia is essentially known as loss of cell polarity with complete disruption of normal tissue architecture. So if your cells, for example, do not look like the squamous epithelial cells that should be there in the cervix, and they end up having these characteristics in exam questions, such as high n to c ratio, dense chromatin, prominent nucleoli, you are going to be thinking of an anaplastic process. The cells lost the ability to look like normal. Our next question. A family with history of polycystic kidney disease presents to the renal clinic for follow-up. Sibling one undergoes renal ultrasound showing an absence of the right kidney. Whereas his brother has a small right kidney relative to normal. So let me go ahead and put the brother's characteristics in a different color. He has a small right kidney. What are the terms used to describe these children's kidney morphology? All right, let's go ahead and think about this. Well, when you're thinking about a patient who is going to have an absence of a kidney, that's known as aplasia. Whereas if somebody has a smaller kidney, that's going to be known as hypo. Now, aplasia is the lack of organ development in the presence of primordial tissue. If you have, for example, renal aplasia, the embryological tissue and the derivatives may be there, but the organ did not develop. Hypoplasia is going to be an incomplete organ development. And this one I want to highlight and star for you because there are many questions that come up on the USMLE related to this. The one question that I, does come to my mind is a patient who ends up having congenital diaphragmatic hernia. In this scenario, patients get the bowel contents that essentially ascend upwards into the thorax and are going to compress the normal lung architecture. As a result, these patients are going to have respiratory deficiency and they are going to have hypoplasia of the lung. Now, what is the term used if there was no primordial tissue, but no organ development? And no organ development, let's put it like that. Well, in this scenario, that's known as agenesis. So aplasia versus agenesis, it's all about whether or not the embryological tissue is actually present. And this is going to be a great segue for us to learn my three-step strategy on how to answer questions. What I do, and many of you know this, I like to use three steps, stem, paraphrase, and predict, and we'll go through that. Let's start with the stem of the question. The stem of the question helps me prime myself to the whole vignette. Which of the following substances most likely binds to the denatured protein, targeting them for catabolism by cytosolic proteosomes. That is the stem. The paraphrase is me going line by line, stopping at every period, 
And thinking like the test maker, why did they put that sentence in the question? Let's go through it. An experiment is conducted in which cells in tissue culture are subjected to high levels of ultraviolet radiation. So I know that ultraviolet radiation to cells is no bueno. Electron microscopy shows cellular damage in the form of increased cytosolic aggregates of denatured proteins. So essentially the cell is breaking down and now you're getting these denatured proteins. In situ hybridization reveals that protein components in these aggregates are also found in proteosomes. So UVB in this experiment, and if you just look at a proteasome, both of them are going to have this protein denatured substances. My prediction is going to be the last step of my process. And that is going to kind of get into my mind a general rough idea of the answer. In this case, what do you think is the correct answer? This is a great time for you to use the chat. Let's go ahead and answer this. What do you guys think? Go for it. Excellent. We have a lot of Fs and you are absolutely correct that that is going to be F. Stem, paraphrase, and predict, guys, is going to be the most important element of question strategy as you go through even your UWorld blocks and your NVMEs. Our next section, guys, is going to be, you got it, cell injury, death, and adaptations. Let's go ahead and get started. And so what we're going to move the narrative to is if the cell cannot adapt, injury occurs. Now, how do I know whether or not a cell will adapt to some sort of stress or become injured? Well, it all is going to be dependent on the type of stress. If the stress is very severe, well, then I know we're going to go down the injury pathway, not the adaptation. And so if you think about it, a chronic process such as GERD will allow cells to adapt. And that's why GERD can cause you to have metaplasia. Whereas if you have some sort of trauma, for example, or a very acute infection, that can cause you to have rapid cell injury. The other element to think about is, for example, a chronic process may cause you to have atrophy. But if you immediately cut off the blood supply, you may get injury or infarction because that's an acute process. It also depends on the type of cell that is going to be affected. Remember that neurons cannot adapt to hypoxia as well as skeletal muscles. I mean, skeletal muscle, when you are going to be lifting weights, for example, you may have some element of hypoxia that's going on in that skeletal muscle region. That's why you end up building lactic acid and you feel sore the next day. Well, our skeletal muscle is able to kind of adapt to not having oxygen for a limited amount of time. For example, for a physiology correlate, the curve shifts to the right. However, when you're thinking about neurons, neurons cannot adapt to hypoxia as well. And remember, neurons cannot really continue to regenerate as well either. And so with this framework in mind, let's go ahead and answer this question. A patient presents with chest pain and shortness of breath. The ED notes his troponins are rising and EKG shows ST segment elevations in the LAD coronary pattern. Well, we know that the troponin is rising, the ST segment is going up, this patient may have a myocardial infarction. Now remember that this question could have given you an EKG that also says V2 to V4 in terms of your EKG leads showing ST segment elevation. Now, what is the likely pathological term explaining this acute process? This is going to be hypoxia. This is very important. Remember, hypoxia is essentially at the tissue level, there's low oxygen. And remember that oxygen is the last electron acceptor in the electron transport chain. There's a biochemistry tie-in. 
And that means that if you have low amount of oxygen, you have low amount of ATP, and that starts the process to lead to cell injury. Because what happens is, is that low ATP causes the cell to swell. And the USMLE loves to ask, why is the cell going to swell? When you have low ATP, the cell swells because your sodium potassium ATPase doesn't work. Remember that the sodium potassium ATPase, they love for you to know that three sodiums are going to come out, two potassiums come in. It's a form of primary active transport that uses ATP. Remember, physiology tie-in thyroid hormone is going to increase your basal metabolic rate by activating your sodium potassium ATPase. Now, when your NAK pump does not actually work, your cell starts to swell. Also, your calcium ATPase doesn't work. Your cell starts to swell. And so when we are thinking about now hypoxia and messing with ATP, let's go ahead and go through mechanisms of hypoxia and use vignettes. So we have a patient with MI and atherosclerosis, and this is related to ischemia. Now, ischemia is going to be when you just are going to have low oxygen in the blood. When you're thinking about that, this typically occurs on the arterial side. And this is related to a blockage. However, from the venous side, if you have a venous blockage, guess what? You can get ischemia upstream. Now, there are pathologies on the USMLE, like, for example, Bud Chiari syndrome, in which you have a thrombosis of the hepatic vein, and that can cause ischemia. Some of the most common causes of Bud Chiari are going to be polycythemia vera, in which you just have increase in your cell lines and thus hyperviscosity, as well as lupus anticoagulant. Remember that these patients are going to be, you got it, hypercoagulable. Shock can cause you to have ischemia as well. And shock is a USMLE concept that you must know before you go into your exam. Second mechanism, a patient with fibrosis of the lung and pulse ox of 85%. You think about this pulse ox, yes, the pulse ox is low and this is hypoxemia. Now hypoxemia is defined as low P little a O2 within the blood. The other thing to understand is that the FiO2 is supposed to go into your alveolar O2. However, if your alveolar O2 cannot go into your arterial O2 and subsequently become your saturations because of this diffusion defect, that is going to be related to hypoxemia. And watch for the pulmonary fibrosis question on your USMLE. The other one is going to be a patient in the trauma bay bleeding after a gunshot wound. Well, you can even relate this vignette to shock, i.e. hypovolemic shock. And this is where you have decreased oxygen carrying capacity of the blood. And this arises when you lose hemoglobin or have some sort of dysfunction of hemoglobin in your exam questions. For example, dysfunction of hemoglobin, you got it. You're gonna be thinking about methemoglobinemia as well as carbon monoxide poisoning. And so when you think about a patient who has a gunshot wound and is essentially losing hemoglobin, do you think PaO2 and SaO2 are going to change your dissolved and your SATs? And actually, they do not change. They are normal. Hemoglobin, dissolved oxygen, and saturations, these are three separate terms that make up your oxygen content in the blood. Let's go through this question. A 34-year-old male complains of several weeks of headaches, lightheadedness, nausea, and myalgias. You can agree with me here that the paraphrase is that nonspecific symptoms. He reports that his wife and teenage children have been also experiencing similar symptoms. So in exam questions, that tells me that it might be infectious because it could be contagious. The family uses a wood-burning stove for both heat and cooking. So not only infectious, but environmental. What value changes the most significantly when you're thinking about this vignette? Think to yourself, what is this vignette? And this is going to be, you got it, your saturations are messed up because you're worried about either cyanide or most typically carbon monoxide poisoning. That is extremely important 
for you to understand on your exam. Again, how they describe it is they're going to say some sort of house fire, oven, in the garage, they left the car on, they get high exposure to carbon monoxide, they come in, their pulse ox may be actually falsely normal. Their pulse ox may be falsely normal. And so this is going to represent the fact that carbon monoxide jumped on to the hemoglobin binding sites and decreased your saturation. It doesn't affect your P little AO2, it doesn't affect your hemoglobin concentration, but it affects the saturations, 100% oxygen or hyperbaric oxygen being the treatment. So when we think about reversible cell injury, the hallmark is going to be cellular swelling. And cellular swelling, these affect three organelles slash structures. Microvilli are going to be messed up when your cell is going to swell. You're also going to get membrane blebbing. So if we think about this, your microvilli end up getting lost, the membrane starts blebbing and pulling away from the cytoskeleton, and you get the rough ER that is going to essentially have decreased protein synthesis. The way I like to think about it is that the ribosomes on the rough ER, think about very tight buttons on a shirt once you've gained the COVID-19, the real COVID-19, you know, DoorDash and everything. So when you are going to have that swelling, those buttons or ribosomes are going to actually pop off. I hope you are laughing at my dad jokes at home. Please, please do. All right. When you're thinking about Irreversible cell injury, let's go ahead and integrate some concepts. So irreversible cell injury, you got to know membrane damage. That's probably the highest yield because when enzymes leak out, you are going to have irreversible cell injury. This is commonly tested in hepatology when you're talking about AST and ALT getting elevated because of hepatocyte damage. For MI, you're going to be thinking about troponin leakage. For muscle, you're going to be thinking about CK. And these are all really good vignettes. Remember that the difference between an n STEMI and unstable angina, remember that both of these are going to have, what? Yes, both of them are going to have ST depression. However, it is the n STEMI that has the troponin elevation, i.e. the membrane damage. Remember that in this Vignette, this is going to be an old lady who's found down for a long time and ends up getting that muscle breakdown, rhabdomyolysis. Hepatitis, we talked about this one. The second thing for us to understand is mitochondrial damage. Now, what is the mechanism here? Well, cytochrome C, when that leaks, that actually initiates caspases and you get apoptosis. Now, other things that could actually cause you to have cell irreversible cell injury that's going to be lysosomes. Remember, lysosomes, they have really, really nasty acidic compounds within them. And remember that calcium, that is going to cause the cell to swell. Look at that. It activates the lysosomal enzymes, and that is also important to integrate. Now, nuclear damage is going to have some terms related to it. Pycnosis, which is nuclear shrinking, karyorexis, which is a breakdown, and then karyolysis. All of these lead to not only irreversible cell injury, but this is a one-way train to cell death. And when we talk about cell death, we need to talk about what kind of cell death are we having. Remember that necrosis is very messy cell death. There's a shit ton of inflammation that comes on. Whereas apoptosis, apoptosis is very clean. When we talk about cell death, let's go ahead and compare and contrast terms. Now, necrosis is going to be where you have that Pycnosis, karyorexis, karyolysis, and subsequently you have inflammation. This is pathologic, and there are terms that we, or types of necrosis that we're going to be talking about. Now, apoptosis, apoptosis, this is where there is no inflammation, and the cell is just going to die by shrinking. It's going to kind of just go into the corner and then just dissolve. The plasma membrane actually is intact, and that's why you can see on your histology ghost cells in which the membrane is still intact, but the cell itself, adios. This can be physiologic as well as pathologic, and remember, no acute inflammation afterwards. All right, guys. Well, stem, paraphrase, and predict. I'll give you about 30 seconds to a minute to answer this question, and we will 
then answer it in the chat. On your mark, get set, go. Hold your answers until the end when I say three, two, one. Hold your answers. All right. All right. I hope you can see me on three. The answer, one, two, three. Let's go ahead and put it in the chat. What do you all think? Going to be A. You're absolutely correct. Now, when you're thinking about A, let's think about it. When you're seeing a little bit elevation in AST, ALT, and the patient is going to have a high bilirubin, yes, you are going to be thinking of the fact that the cell is going to be releasing the intrinsic enzymes, and that's why you're getting an elevation in those lab values. This patient, when they have hepatitis A, they are going to have inflammation of the liver, and that inflammation could cause you to have some form of irreversible cell injury. All right, here's another question. Let's go through it together. Stem, paraphrase, and predict. And I hope you all are staying active and engaged as we go through this. Which of the following morphological cellular changes most likely suggests a diagnosis of acute tubular necrosis? Stem. Paraphrase is next. A 33-year-old woman has had increased lethargy and decreased urine output for the past week. So decreased urine output for the past week and lethargy. These are concerning dehydration findings. Laboratories show that the creatinine is high. BUN is also high. In exam questions, do the BUN to creatinine ratio real quick. And if it's 10 to 15, you know that there's intrinsic cell damage or intrinsic kidney damage. A renal biopsy is performed and the specimen is examined using electron microscopy. Electron microscopy showing ATN, remember that's related to muddy brown cast. And that's kind of my prediction, the muddy brown cast. And so essentially I know that that is a form of irreversible cell injury that led to cell death. And so in that scenario, we are thinking about that messy, messy necrosis process. Remember, karyorexis, karyolysis, exactly. That is important. This is all related to nuclear fragmentation. All right, here's another one. Let's go ahead and allow you at home to stem, paraphrase, and predict. On your mark, get set, and go. Come on, guys. I know you can say active and engage. 30 seconds starts now. All right, guys. What do you think is going to be the correct answer here? Excellent. Excellent. Yes. We have that columnar metaplasia because this is going to be, you got it, the Barrett's esophagus question.